Welcome to Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and I am very glad to have all of you following the show. Uh, we are streaming simultaneously to YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, but on YouTube, of course, you can also subscribe to the channel and be alerted uh, uh, when we are going live in the future or to watch past uh, episodes of uh, Searching for the Question Live. Uh, we also have a Discord channel. Uh, you can come and uh, become part of the conversation on davidorban.com slash discord. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, if you uh, like uh, what uh, I am producing with the help of my team, uh, you are welcome to become a supporter on patreon.com slash davidorban. Today, we are going to talk about uh, synthetic biology. Uh, people... Uh, who are passionate about this field claim that uh, what physics uh, was for the 20th uh, century, synthetic biology, biology in general, uh, our ability to program life uh, is going to be for the 21st century. And um, I am very excited and, and privileged to be able to talk about this fantastically uh, interesting and intriguing subject with uh, one of the world's uh, experts, uh, Andrew Hassel. Uh, Andy and I have been friends for uh, over 10 years, and uh, here he is. Uh, Andy, thank you very much for being with us today. Hi, David. So uh, one thing that I love doing uh, um, uh, with, with my guests uh, is, is to show uh, where we are. I am uh, in Bergamo, Italy, and you are around here. Uh, in the redwoods uh, north of San Francisco, right? That's correct. I'm, I'm up in an area called the Russian River, which is well known for the wines it produces. Uh, Russian River, let's see what uh, Google shows us in terms of uh, images. There you go. Beautiful area, beautiful area. And I visited you. Um, you are uh, in, in this um, cool cabin very modern cabin of yours, rather than the May house. And behind you, we can see the redwoods uh, already. So uh, for you in, in uh, this time of uh, physical distancing, uh, working uh, digitally in your um, very advanced and modern, but at the same time, very secluded place was basically no change. Well, you know, we moved to New York in September, so our timing was impeccable. Um, and, uh, and of course, because I, I'm interested in virology, I was tracking this particular virus, uh, since basically mid January, um, uh, in March, we, we said we have to get back and, and because the, the density in New York is famous, of course, it's you, you are crowded onto an island with 8 million people. We live in Manhattan. Um, uh, here, there are fewer people in our zip code uh, than there are in our building in New York. So it was a <laughs> better place to social distance with a couple of kids. Uh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and, and, and I hope uh, that uh, you and, and your family are able to get back to New York because, of course, it is a fantastically stimulating place for growing up uh, kids where you are is very healthy uh, but uh, your kids are are destined to 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 be brainiacs uh, so they deserve uh, what uh, whatever uh, crazy direction they can build in in, in New York uh, and New York is kind of perfect for kids because it is so dense. There's so many museums and restaurants and parks and activities, that, which is exactly why we, we thought we'd give them the counterpoint to this place in the country, which is, which is idyllic. We're only a few miles from the ocean. There's plenty of trees, but it, you really do need the stimulation of culture for kids as well. So yeah. uh, it's you know it's a, maybe it's a bit extreme from you know the the redwoods to you know to Manhattan, but it it works out pretty well for us. So we're we're not sure when we'll get back right now. A lot of it is dictated by when the schools can reopen safely. Um, but but you know at least we're, uh, I hope that people are comfortable wherever they are. Um, there have been some experiments in uh, uh, Italy and Europe in general. And it is pretty weird uh, to pretend that kids can stay two meters from each other 
and classes can be as small as five kids, um, it is going to be very, very hard to make it work uh, scalably and reliably. But uh, you know, we we have to we have to find new ways. So going back uh, a few years, uh, how did you get to do what you do? Um, were, were you in kindergarten already saying, oh my God, I want to program life? <laughs> I, I always had a, an odd perspective on life. I, I sometimes describe myself as Benjamin Button. Um, when I was young, I was very serious. Um, and uh, as I've gotten older, I've relaxed and are uh, just a lot more playful. Um, I have less life to lose. Let's put it that way. I don't have to make such <laughs> tough decisions. Um, but my interest, my interest in life science really gelled. Um, uh, I can remember almost the specific day when I had to choose some programs in high school. And, and I, I'm interested in anything mechanical, electrical, computational. But I realized all those things are things. And, and in general, things don't mean a lot to me. My house could burn down and, and it wouldn't matter as long as the people got out. Um, so when I started to reflect on, on, on my values, I guess, I, I realized that I'm only really interested in living things. And um, I, I'm the type of guy that likes to get to the to first principles or to the bottom. And, and so I switched all of my studies to, um, to cell biology, which is the smallest functional unit of life, and to genetics, which is essentially the universal programming language for living things. Um, is it, is it uh, um, correct to say that, uh, you know, a little facetiously, that synthetic biology is nanotechnology that works? I believe that quote is attributed to Tom Knight, uh, who is also recognized as the father of synthetic biology. He's a, uh, a legendary computer scientist that, that migrated um, to biology in the 1990s and is really the, considered the person who, who started synthetic biology at MIT. Um, uh, but our, let's just say our views are highly aligned. Uh, my experience came from working with computers in early days. Uh, I think I bought my first computer in 1981. Um, and what I quickly started to see was that the architectures of computers were, were very similar to the architectures of life science, at least seen through my lenses. Um, and, and granted, biology is far more complex than any computer system we have today or any, and, and, and computer isn't the best analogy because computers just manipulate information. It's almost like a robotic factory. Um, and the cell as a robotic factory is incredibly complex. But today we see robotic factories that are becoming more and more complex. So it's easier to make that connection. But in the 1980s, it was, it was a, pretty um, odd, odd position uh, to take. And, and, and the amazing thing uh, is that uh, uh, our factories, as robotic as they are, for the moment, do not uh, possess the self-contained knowledge and ability to build another factory by themselves. Right. But living things do. So it yeah. is a robotic factory that is able to build other robotic factories. Yeah, the way to look at it is the cell is, is a, if you put it in the terms of 3D printing, the, the cell is a multi-material 3D printer. It can make literally thousands and thousands of different materials, all using elemental building blocks, um, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and it has the full set of instructions to make another 3D printer. So it's almost the holy grail of 3D printing, the 3D printer that makes more 3D printers. And uh, uh, you uh, look at, or you started with, with, uh, with cells and, and, and genetics, but then you went deeper uh, in, in, in a certain sense because you are now working and you have been for, for some time, more specifically with viruses. 
Well, I, it's the way I frame things because if you, I look at DNA as a programming language for all living things based on cells. And, and so those DNA instructions literally guide the cellular machinery uh, to, to do its operations, to manufacture the materials that it needs and, and to kind of run this whole machine. Um, and, and, but I'm, I'm a very bottom up kind of guy. The cell is fantastically complex. There's, there's, there's still no real time um, model of, of a single living cell. So I just started to take it down and down to the lowest possible point that I could start with. Now, some people start with the protein because proteins are the basic building blocks and of, of structural materials and catalytic materials like enzymes. Um, and, and for a time I worked in, in, the, in the protein area, but I'm really fascinated by whole genomes. And so I started to look at, well, what is, what's the smallest whole genomes I could work with? And, and those tend to be viruses. But, but really, if you look at DNA as a programming language, there's kind of three tasks. There's reading the code, which we call sequencing. And today, um, sequencing is highly advanced and, and on generation, on machines that are like generation eight or nine, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but now we are now, and there's a, a, a very large field uh, that we kind of lump together as bioinformatics or systems biology, which is analyzing this data and, and understanding the code. It's like interpreting the language. And with synthetic biology, now we're learning to write that code and to use it in a creative way. Um, and, and so I think that's pretty fantastic, but the simplest, the simplest code to write outside in genomics is the genome of a virus. Um, and, uh, and sorry, that would, uh, you said yeah. there are three things that the DNA uh, does, uh, uh, or we, 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 uh, we read it, mm -hmm. uh, which is the sequencing, writing, and what is the third? Uh, comprehension. It's, it's oh, like okay. learning any Interpreting language. Interpreting the meeting. Yeah. Uh, Interpreting, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, talking about the first, um, I started um, about a year ago to talk about what I call jolting technologies, uh, which are those where uh, the, the rate of change is not merely accelerating at a constant rate, but where the rate of acceleration is itself increasing. And one of the examples, together with quantum computing and artificial intelligence that I always bring when I talk about jolting technologies is um, uh, the uh, ability uh, that we developed to decode DNA sequences at, an, at, a, at a decrease in cost per uh, base that hasn't been following the sedate uh, expectations of Moore's law, but has been dropping much faster uh, at an accelerating at a rate whose acceleration has been increasing. Um, so we have decoded uh, the human genome twenty years ago at a cost of three billion dollars, and now uh, what is it? Um, maybe two thousand. No, it's less than that. Um, uh, Nebula Genomics here in the U.S. charges two hundred ninety-nine dollars plus a data interpretation plan. Um, uh, recently, BGI, the the Chinese gene DNA sequencing powerhouse, uh, believe they just got the cost down to a hundred dollars, um, and they're starting to roll that out. And then there's other groups that are working on the forefront of the latest technologies. That oh, no, I only have four yeah. hours to get an additional $50 off. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so this is amazing. Like this is the lowest, and this is for 30X, which is kind of clinical grade whole genome sequencing. Um, you know, this is, this is better than the first sequence that was made for $3 billion. So wow. it, it's, it's, 
kind of staggering how quickly the price has dropped. And yet this is still a technology that very few people wake up, as I like to say, wake up in the morning and go, man, I'm going to go get gene sequence today. Like it, it's not the same as going and purchasing a new phone right now. And yet it's some of the most important technology we've ever developed. But we, we had students at uh, Singularity University who actually went out and did uh, four different sequencing 10 years ago, and it cost them, you know, some pretty, pretty buck yeah. uh, because they wanted to compare the services, compare the results. And it was really fascinating. Uh, and we, we, we were looking at them uh, a bit enviously and, uh, and uh, they were having a lot of fun. We were humbling, or at least I was, uh, uh, content uh, with uh, 23 and me, uh, which only gives you half a million of the SNPs, the um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. It's basically single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, of uh, rather than the whole uh, three billion uh, bases. It's a fancy so, way of changing, saying some letters have changed. Um, that's right. In, in that's various right. marker genes. So, so, so uh, this is a, a, a known thing and, and something that is already going on an industrial scale. Uh, and you went on to the second thing, which is uh, writing it. Or, or does interpreting comes before being able to write? Well, interpretation is being done by a larger and larger community. And it's being done in a more and more automated way. When you... When you uh, so today, there's essentially data analysis pipelines that have been married to the sequencing you know, machines. So that as the material is, you know, as a genome is being read, it's also being interpreted and analyzed pretty much at the same time. Um, but, and, and of course, that becomes a bigger and bigger machine. More and more sequencers, sequencing more and more people or more and more creatures, um, all being analyzed with with more and more sophisticated systems. Um, and, and I think it was just that growing complexity of all this data that made me kind of stop and go, wait, uh, if we also have this technology of writing DNA, it is, uh, it is or think of it as manipulating DNA code. It's, it's learning to program DNA. We use that creatively. It's it's basically the the foundation of the biotech industry, and and so I just started to think. Well, clearly, it's going to become more digital and easier for people to do this to program DNA because most of the you don't need the lab anymore. You need a laptop. Uh, you're working with digital DNA for the most part, uh, a, a complicated form of word processor. And when you're finished doing your manipulations, you can hit print and then synthesize the DNA molecule from scratch. And that to me was so exciting that I, I wanted to change my focus in genetics right away. And, and I, so I've been thinking, I've been you know, interested in synthetic biology before synthetic biology had a name. Um, I was calling DNA synthesis companies to see how many how many base pairs of DNA they could string together back in 1998. I think was the first time I checked in with them. Um, and 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 at the time, uh, was the number a few dozen, or, or was it already a few hundred? Well, there were there were some advances in. Uh, so at the time, you could go and synthesize a few hundred base pairs of DNA, but it was really expensive. Like mm -hmm. uh, uh, a price point for around 2000, uh, the year 2000 was was approximately 15 to 20 dollars per base pair. Um, so, so, so give me, so, give me a, 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 a simple example of uh, what can people do uh, with some synthetic uh, gene sequence. What what is the purpose of of uh, of sequencing? Uh, not not a whole organism, which is what we are gonna talk about shortly, but um, the normal industrial applications. 
Well, well, we're we're confusing things. So I was talking about synthesis, and you just brought up sequencing, David. Um, and and synthesis of DNA is learning to program it, and you have to have an intention for programming. Um, and and whereas reading the DNA, you don't necessarily need an intention. You just want to open the book and and read the code and analyze it. So, but but just to be clear, writing DNA in the year two thousand. You remember, that's when we sequenced the first human genome. Yes. Uh, the draft was done. That was a big effort. But writing DNA, we were technically limited to a few hundred nucleotides of DNA. And so it was very, we only used it for very specific things. In general, because you can use it as a probe, because DNA is double-stranded. So the complementary strand of DNA will bind to its, okay. to its sister, essentially. Um, so you can use it as a probe to look for DNA. Um, there were there were groups that were synthesizing large numbers of short fragments of DNA as probes. That's that's a useful thing. That was the first application. That was one, and the other one was was something called polymerase chain reaction, which was which was developed by the Nobel Prize winner Kerry Mullis, and it's a way to amplify DNA. And for that, you have a strand of DNA, and you put a primer on uh, in the forward direction and the reverse direction, and you do a synthesis reaction that allows you to double the amount of DNA, and then you repeat that process. So you get one strand of DNA to two, to four, to eight, to 16. It's truly exponential growth. And, and it requires short fragments of DNA sp uh, uh, that have been synthesized called primers specific to regions that you want to amplify. Or, or do this chain reaction. So those at the time around year 2000, that was the only real applications I was seeing uh, synthetic DNA being used. And then- uh, in Harry Mullis, yeah. uh, uh, who you mentioned, went on to write uh, a very funny book, Dancing Naked in the Mind Field. I don't know if you read it. Yeah. Uh, once, yeah. Once, once you win a Nobel Prize, you can afford to, to, to be uh, half naked on the cover of uh, of your own book, uh, and everybody will take it seriously, even if it has a title like this. Oh, Kerry was was is well was he's passed on, but was a genius, and and uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize very quickly after the, the discovery of PCR because it was that important to the field of genomics. It, it's really a foundational tool. Um, but anyway, the, you know, that was around, so I just gave you kind of the state of the world in 2000. The very first genome, essentially the full program of an organism to be synthesized was done in uh, 2002 by uh, a scientist at Stony Brook University in the United States. Um, and he synthesized the entire genome of a virus. Um, it was polio virus, uh, which was not a great ambassador for the field, but, but he, was, he was very interested in, in vaccine work. And, and of course, conquering polio was one of the big you know, medical breakthroughs of, of the last century. So, um, so polio virus was the first virus synthesized in 2002. And in the subsequent 18 years, um, there, there's still only be, been a handful of synthetic genomes made, uh, approximately somewhere between 40 and 50, most of them being virus genomes. The most recent one that I've seen being SARS-CoV-2 uh, made from scratch. Um, and then there have been three microbial genomes uh, that have been synthesized from scratch and published as well. So just to, to make it clear, um, uh, how many base pairs is, for example, COVID-2, uh, um, SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, SARS-CoV-2 is, is uh, approximately 30,000 base pairs of code, just under 30,000. So we are now able to synthesize and put together a sequence of 30,000 base pairs. Routinely. Wow. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the paper on SARS-CoV-2, which was published in the journal Nature, um, described the process. Uh, remember, the Chinese published the sequence of this new virus that was causing an outbreak of pneumonias in Wuhan um, in, on January 10th, 
uh, only mm -hmm. 10 days after it was formally identified as the, the virus that was responsible. Um, and the Nature paper describing the, the synthesis of that genome, the assembly of the genome, and the boot up essentially of that genome to make virus particles that were then characterized took, uh, that paper was submitted to Nature on February 20th. So it wow. took so it took just a little over a month to do the entire process. To 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 jump ahead because we we touched upon the subject. Yeah. If we are able to analyze and synthesize SARS-CoV-2, could one approach to uh, develop a vaccine be the ability to eliminate parts of the virus that cause harm? Just to label it very naively and and leave those parts of the virus that trigger an, uh, the appropriate uh, immune reaction so that when the real one comes it is recognized that's a great question and and absolutely yes there's multiple ways to make a vaccine um, you can just uh, but one of the way you just described uh, is called making a an, an attenuated live vaccine and using synthetic biology, it's it's easy to relatively easy. Uh, all these things take some work, uh, but but you can reprogram the virus to weaken it, um, and you can make it still live, but it uh, replicate is the the correct term. You can make it replicate, but it is it replicates so slowly that it's not going to cause uh, disease and your immune system, but your immune system still treats it as if it was the, the fully functioning virus. Um, you, you caught yourself uh, uh, calling viruses alive because uh, it is still not completely agreed upon by the specialists whether viruses are a, a form of life or not? No, uh, well, there's some debate, but, but to me, a virus is a USB stick. And, and it really is just a vehicle for loading code into a particular cell. And as we all know, a USB stick is inert without a computer. So, okay. it's, so I think the, the, actually the scientists that synthesized the first virus, uh, the first genome, uh, Dr. Uh, Eckert Wimmer, described the virus as a chemical with a life cycle, um, which I thought was really um, quite brilliant because you can actually define um, a virus with an empirical chemical formula. Um, so so I'm, I, I find that really quite elegant, um, but I also look at viruses as, um, yeah, I really do look at them as, as the software, the, the apps uh, of, of biological life, because they're not a full genome uh, to a cell, like it's not an operating system for a cell, it, but it's enough to add new functions to the cell. And, uh, and we, we will come back to this because uh, it is a little bit the crux of, of uh, also what, what you want to be doing and what you are already doing. Uh, but uh, we have a couple of questions that I want to address from our audience. Uh, Emiliano is asking if uh, there is a science fiction movie about synthetic biology. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, I, I'm sure there are. There's certainly plenty of science fiction books, uh, um, but I'm just trying to, th I'm struggling to think of one off the top of my head. Um, but I can, I can tell the, the one that kind of pulled me in, and it, it's, it's ancient history now, was Blade Runner. Okay. Um, because in Blade Runner, they were making these organisms, replicants, uh, essentially humanoid robots, and they were clearly growing them. Um, but, but my favorite character in the movie Blade Runner was, was, um, I guess he was a scientist. His name was J.F. Sebastian. And when he goes into his home in the Bradbury building in, in, in Los Angeles, which is a real building, um, uh, his, his suite is filled with, with genetically engineered toy friends that he had created. And, and that left a, a, a really lasting impression on me. And, and, and he is also a maker. So, so with all kinds of tools uh, on the edge of uh, sanctioned uh, or, or, or non-sanctioned uh, abilities, he is uh, creating. Um, 
and and uh, we have a response. Uh, uh, it's funny because Emiliano is asking over Twitter yeah. and from YouTube. Uh, they are they are responding. Nodus Labs is responding to Emiliano. Annihilation is a good uh, movie. Uh, oh, and I, Annihilation is a creepy movie, um, it, it, it and, is, it, and the book it, is even creepier, in my opinion. But but I don't look at that so much as synthetic biology, as as you know, kind of a weird force of mutation. Synthetic biology is very much like programming. You 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 don't just sit down and decide you're going to do synthetic biology. You you sit down. You're in. You might be interested in the tools and the processes, but uh, what really what really defines synthetic biology, in my opinion, is that you have an intention. You want to go and build something and you have the machinery of life, of biochemistry and the programming language of DNA as, as part of your tool set. A, a book that I very much recommend uh, both to Nodus and uh, Emiliano, if uh, they haven't read it, is Blood Music by uh, Greg Bear. Uh, uh, the, 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 the book, and I'm not going to spoil it, but, uh, starts with a guy not wanting to stop his experiments just because his lab is being shut down. And so leaving his lab, he injects himself with the specimens that would be lost. Mm. And that is the starting point of the book that goes on to amazing, uh, transformations of, of, uh, what biology can be. Um, and and uh, uh, Nodus Labs uh, has another question as well, uh, which is is an important one. Um, what do you think about uh, the issues and the challenges of privacy around uh, DNA data? Is it a, is it a problem or or not in in your in your view? Uh, I think I think data and privacy are very important. Um, I, so I've I've explored the space in a couple of ways. One, um, I've, I've, I've been watching these next generation companies and, I, and with, ne with Nebula, I've actually been an advisor, um, but they're built on privacy. So they use some of the most sophisticated encryption that's available today. And they also make the case that your genome is yours. You own it. They are more of a uh, of a of a manager, um, I like that model a lot, and have written about it, and and I think it's it's absolutely where we need to go forward in in this area. But I've also taken the, I guess, somewhat extreme step of of saying my genome is open source, and I was one of the first people in in you know, to go and open source my genome because I don't really have that much to lose. I, I'd rather share it with the world and with medical professionals uh, so they have, yeah. so they can start to work with this information. Yeah, I, I, I did the same. I also provided my genome for uh, medical research in, in open source. Uh, and what I did, and this was 10 years ago, your children are younger. My children was were, were, were small. Uh, but uh, I still have them on video and had them at the time on video after explaining them what I was doing of them giving their consent. Because when you put your DNA uh, available to others, you are putting half of the DNA of your children as well. Yeah. And then forever, all of your descendants. Well, part of part when I opened when I did the work to open my genome uh, with the Personal Genome Project in Canada because I'm Canadian, um, I, I did have to reach out to my family members and and speak with them about this because my you also sh you also share DNA code with your siblings, not yes. just your children, your parents. Yes. We're all connected by DNA, uh, and yes. you know we're we're learning that now as the field of of forensics is now. Um, you know, forensic DNA analysis, like the FBI does with CSI, um, uh, is now being uh, linked together with with genealogy databases, and we're seeing some really, you know, we're seeing some cold cases, you know, 30, 40 years old being solved because of these connections. It, it, the The privacy issue is not going to go away. Um, if anything, it will get 
more complex as we start to use uh, genetic testing, um, as genetic testing replaces metabolic testing that we currently do with babies, that we currently do with babies. Um, because essentially uh, every baby born will, will have their genomes essentially banked. Uh, and uh, I am showing uh, my 23andMe results. Uh, it is, it is um, today, unfortunately, just fun. It used to be much more powerful in terms of uh, medically relevant results. And uh, the FDA agreed not to kill 23andMe, and in return, 23andMe agreed to commit kind of suicide because uh, they they stopped providing consumers uh, really interesting data, which which uh, um, uh, um, uh, the American regulators today believe uh, we are all too stupid to to have. And and I only can't speak for them, but yeah, no, we're all learning by doing. Like priesthood gonna... of medical professionals are allowed to interpret them for you. Mm -hmm. I always talk about this uh, uh, with the analogy of uh, uh, Martin Luther and his translation of the Bible uh, that disintermediated the Vatican, uh, and we are still before that kind of reformist uh, thrust. Um, so back to the narrative of your passion for sequencing uh, uh, living things, uh, sorry, synthesizing living things, things building uh, life forms. Uh, what are the next steps? Well, right now, I, I think the next step is we're, we're seeing synthetic biology be used for a growing um, spectrum of applications. Um, uh, like put it this way, biology touches our life in so many ways. Uh, we tend to think of we tend to think of genetics mainly as health, but but with synthetic biology, you start to do things like diagnostic tests. You start to do things like foods. You start to be able to consider uh, manufacturing of 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 specialty chemicals to commodity chemicals to just building materials, construction materials. Uh, like biology touches everything that we do uh, pretty much in the world. So, but again, I'm, I'm, so there's a, a growing industry related to synthetic biology and it's thriving because it's exploring things like how do I make a new tool set based on, on these new technologies and, and bring it out to the world, the picks and shuffles. You're seeing you're seeing uh, specialty chemicals and reagents, foods and 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 uh, food and drink, essentially. Um, we're we're and and what I'm moving towards is is essentially just building building organisms that do useful things. And so again, starting bottom up because I want to minimize the lab. I want to make processes that turn digital code into molecular DNA code into the organism um, and do it you know, pretty much in a machine. Um, we've been working to make viruses, but good viruses. We, we've been developing viruses that give, um, that give cancer essentially the flu. Um, and, and that's been a passion of mine for a while because the virus is, is relatively straightforward to work with in terms as a, as a biological organism, because as I said, it's like a USB stick. In the absence of a computer, it's harmless. Um, viruses are also very specific for different cell types and organisms. So you can, you can learn this trade of working with viruses on very safe viruses. I started working with an E. coli virus that is so safe to use, um, you could probably spread it on toast and eat it, 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 it like Vegemite. Um, but, but the knowledge that we got prototyping, making that harmless virus informed us to make the world's first fully synthetic cancer-fighting virus. Um, and we did that in, in in 2016, 2017. And then since then, we've been taking that 
education and and making a process to do those cancer fighting viruses faster and cheaper and now we're moving towards uh now we're moving towards the clinic um in the history of uh computing we had uh, waves of centralization and decentralization mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning we had uh, mainframes with dumb terminals uh, and then the personal computer revolution put powerful computing on everyone's desk and now with uh, with uh, so much uh, of the functionality migrating into our browsers uh, we are back uh, to a paradigm that uh, reassesses the balance uh, of computing between centralized and decentralized again what is the uh, natural architecture of uh, synthetic biology and and uh, is it going to have the same kind of rhythm to it over the course of the years or yeah. it will down in something that will then be the way we do it all over yeah right now i look at it as a manufacturing process uh, a, a fair amount of it is digital again you can go to digital libraries that contain thousands of uh, the genomes of thousands of organisms um, in the one that I mainly go to is called NCBI, the National Center for Biotechnology Information. It's run by the National Institutes of Health. Um, so, but in general, a lot of these uh, these academic databases are sh uh, have have global sharing. Um, so there's there you can get the digital data. Um, the design process is very much like computer-aided design. You use software sit in front of the computer. And it's only when you kind of hit print that it starts the manufacturing process. And, and it's a two-step manufacturing process in this case. One, you have to manufacture the molecular DNA that is the program for the cells. That's a, that's a process that is complex and is, is outsourced to specialists. Uh, one of the, the the company that I usually hold up for this is Twist Biosciences uh, here in, in the Bay Area. They, they're one of the powerhouses in DNA synthesis, uh, but there's other companies. I don't, uh, so you can think of them as the compilers. And then once you've got the synthesized DNA that can run the biological machinery, then you have to get it into a cell or cell-free system, which is essentially all the guts of a cell in a tube. And, and now you can start to reprogram that biological machinery to do something useful. So, so it's, it's right now, there's, there's no way to just do all of synthetic biology on your desk. Um, but, there's, but as we get more sophisticated, uh, I, I see a path where one day the entire molecular biology lab will, will fit in a device not much bigger than this. Um, and of course, be completely online and have interfaces to operate it. So, so I think there will be a little bit of, of back and forth as the technology continues to evolve. But I completely believe that most of the molecular work that we do to synthesize DNA and boot up at least simple structures like viruses, perhaps single-celled organisms, will happen on chips and, and be much more accessible. I also want to be clear, this tends to scare a lot of people, but I believe that there will be a full stack security process as part of this as well, just as we have digital security for all of our electronic systems. Um, so I think as we do that, biosecurity becomes much more robust than any of the security we have today with our wet lab facilities scattered around the world. Um, our organisms have been developing um, security systems for billions of years. Yes. And, and there are millions of viruses that can do nothing against our defenses and and only sometimes the weaker of us are attacked to a degree where we die because of the attack which by the way is against the interests of the attackers too so there is a very fine balance that can be found everywhere in in, in life uh, there was a wonderful book uh, in the 70s uh, called uh, Never Cry Wolf 
uh, where uh, the oil companies pay a, a, a researcher uh, to go in the uh, Canadian Arctic uh, to prove that uh, the caribous are being exterminated by the wolves, uh, which of course is, is craziness. Uh, and and uh, it also became then a surprisingly good uh, movie by Disney. And 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 the message of the movie is there is balance in nature, and the, and the wolves are lucky to catch one caribou, which is the oldest or the youngest that cannot keep up with the rest. And a little bit is the same with uh, with the viruses and our organisms, uh, where the virus has to fight really hard to do anything. Uh, because uh, we are the result of of billions of years of of fighting against them successfully. Well, and, and sometimes they don't just get the youngest or oldest. It's not just culling the herd, so to speak. But but you know, viruses are opportunistic. If they get the right environment and situation and have the right code, um, yeah, they'll they'll take advantage of it. They're they're not. There's no good or bad virus. Uh, it, it is just it is just nature doing is, its is, thing. Is it is it uh, reasonable to expect that the genetic drift of a virus that is successful uh, will keep it to a degree of lethality that is compatible with the survival of its host? Yeah. So so if if it's if it's a single host virus like if it only replicates in humans obviously if it kills if it kills too aggressively it's going to die out um if it if it so there is very much that balance between in infectivity and and disease uh, particularly mortality um because the virus just wants to survive that's like all living things that's what it's kind of aiming to do and not with any intention but just through biophysics um, but there, there are opportunities. And again, you're seeing in, with coronavirus, for example, you're seeing a virus come from another species, jump into human there. It, it, it could have a, com it, it could have been tuned very differently for that other species, been harmless in that other species. But when it jumps to human, uh, it can be much more lethal. Those viruses can have very high mortality rates because, uh, because humans aren't its natural host. That's right. That's right. And they don't care killing all of us because they can always go back to the to the source. Yeah, the reservoir is in an yeah. animal population. Yeah. Um, and is it is it the case that when you say that uh, that synthetic biology will be a very secure um, field is because we can leverage the uh, natural mechanisms of security around it, uh, or or we will have to develop new ones because. If we look at what happened in computing, we haven't been that good at building secure computing systems. Uh, the, 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 our computers are very unreliable and bug-ridden and, and exposed to all kinds of uh, um, you know, um, ways to be exploited against uh, uh, what, what we want uh, to do with them. So... so well so let me, our computers are evolving. Our computer networks are evolving. Our computer security is evolving. But they've it's only had a few decades. Like I remember in the 1980s, there was no computer security. Mm -hmm. um, so so today we actually have very robust computer security compared to back then. And and clearly it's working because the world runs on computers. And while there are hacks and while there are vulnerabilities the benefits far outweigh the risks um, and and that's otherwise we'd all turn off our computers and go home um, but and, and there's always the anecdotal so biology I think is very much the same way the the thing that I find frustrating today is biology is not an engineering discipline it's artisanal cooking and with with a very complex set of tools and reagents and and expertise and and so it's very hard to get standardization it's very hard to build processes that are robust i think synthetic biology brings makes it truly an engineering field like software engineering which by the way is part engineering and part artisanal as you know um 
So, so this is this is where we're transitioning. But I would expect moving forward, because biology is so so complex that most of the analysis, it's data rich and complex, that most of the analysis and most of the design is going to be done with, with, with software tools. I think the, the engineering process of design, build, test, and then learn to iterate your designs, I think that's really going to become a closed feedback loop. Um, it it reminds me uh, of the original definition of uh, uh, an Amazon platform uh, that, that call, was called and is called, probably still exists, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, the Mechanical Turk uh, was a, a marvel of uh, uh, Enlightenment uh, Europe uh, where a wooden uh, box had a robot on top that could play chess. And, and it was brought uh, around by its uh, inventor in all the uh, various um, um, kingdoms and princedoms. And, and it was really amazing, except that it was hiding a midget who was playing chess. So Amazon Mechanical Obviously a very smart. Yeah, a smart, a smart midget, yes. Midget, yeah. and, and, uh, and Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, was or is a platform for artificial intelligence that uh, actually is fake. You feed it the task and then humans do it. Mm -hmm. and, and originally it was, for example, labeling photos or extracting information from from uh, web pages or whatever that, that computers couldn't do. But to you, using the service makes no difference. Yeah. So uh, what it could happen is that there will be kind of a virus as a service or, or organism as a service where you put together whatever you want, you press the button, and then as much of it happens automatically as possible at a given moment, and the rest happens with people just, you know, working with vials and and in a wet lab. I, I certainly hope not. I, I'm a <laughs> I am not a fan of of smart people doing liquid handling. I totally uh, agree. So and, so and and I usually say that if you can see the liquid, you've got a million times too much. Like. Are, are you that's right. Are, are, so are we there yet that the human can be uh, uh, designed out of the process? On some of the most advanced fabs that I've seen, yes. The, 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 the processes that they've been setting up either drive evolution to a particular point or they are working with very precise code that is that is being tested and iterated and driving towards an intention very quickly. So so yeah, I think I I, I fully expect that um, some of the routine work, like making a cancer drug, uh, which should be a, a process, it's increasingly becoming a process. I think that will be done by by dark labs, the labs with no humans, so the lights are out. Uh, we only have a few minutes because you have a hard stop, but there are a couple of questions from Emiliano that I still want to address. Uh, one is if uh, uh, you ultraviolet light can kill viruses or not. Apparently, this is an open question. I didn't realize. No, no it's, it's common. Ultraviolet light is very energetic light. It promotes cross-linking of proteins, inactivating them. So UV light can be a very powerful antiseptic. Okay, good. Second question, uh, what is the relationship between AI and synthetic biology? Is, is, does, does AI, is, are our machine learning algorithms and generative adversarial networks and whatever they are powerful already so that they play a role in, in guiding the intuition and enabling uh, synthetic biology projects? Yeah, so it's getting closer. So right now I'm seeing AI used a lot in protein engineering, which is, again, kind of a step down from genome engineering. I'm seeing it used in chemical engineering. Um, so AI, the relationship between AI and life science is, is growing more and more sophisticated by the day. We're essentially seeing a fusion of those two fields. Um, right now, the problem doing it with synthetic biology is we're not getting the feedback loop uh, as quickly as we might like. 
because it still takes time to synthesize, in my case, a genome and then boot up that genome and get results and then feed that data back in. But it will, uh, it will continue to accelerate and, and parallelize to the point where only AI will be able to deal with the data flows. So, uh, uh, Andy, um, there is not, not maybe not a billion years worth, but uh, I guarantee a century's worth of things to talk about. And in an hour, uh, uh, I know, <laughs> can scratch the surface. Um, I, I hope you will be able to come back and we will talk more. Uh, uh, we didn't talk about uh, your company, Humane uh, Genomics, um, and and your projects around cancer vaccines and uh, and other things. Uh, we didn't talk about uh, uh, the Genome Right project and the Human Genome Right, incredibly <laughs> well, ambitious project. Well, let's look at it this way: we, in this conversation, in this hour, we laid a foundation. Um, we kind of explained the basics of programming life. We talked about programming the simplest organisms, viruses. And of course, today we realize that that's going to be part of our defense network for not only it is part of the defense network for SARS-CoV-2, but it'll definitely be part of the defense network for the future uh, biological threats. Um, but let's let's move it forward with with particular disease applications. And then yes, the Genome Project Right, which is, which the inspiration for that was the last Human Genome Project, which really uh, kick-started the reading of all uh, DNA. So maybe we yeah. can do another, another hour. Emiliano is thanking us and he's saying that he wants uh, you back. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you have an additional fan. Thank you very much, Andy, and uh, see you soon. You're welcome, David. So uh, an important thing that I want to remind all of you uh, is that uh, as I'm chatting with uh, my guests, uh, uh, I am actually uh, collecting the links. Uh, and then we are adding the links to the description uh, of the shows. So if any of you want to learn more uh, from Wikipedia articles uh, to the... Uh, um, to the, uh, the books uh, that we are mentioning on Amazon uh, that you can read right away on your Kindle, uh, Khan Academy courses, um, scientific uh, publications uh, on uh, the role of artificial intelligence and uh, protein uh, uh, design. These are all uh, available right away. And, and I believe that the speed of this uh, matters uh, because going from the inspiration that a conversation like this can give you uh, to the ability to absorb a, a deeper and deeper level of understanding is uh, uh, makes makes a concrete material difference. So I hope uh, you like it and that uh, you will uh, come back for more uh, in uh, the next uh, episodes of uh, Searching for the Question Live. Thank you. Bye-bye.